Okay, we'll talk about the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton includes the skull, vertebral column, and rib cage, while the appendicular skeleton includes our upper, low, and lower limbs, as well as their attachments, the pectoral and pelvic girdles. The focus at this point is the axial skeleton. This will be covered in three parts. We'll begin with some terminology. So the features of bones include projections that help to form joints, depressions and openings where arteries and veins can travel along, rough areas where muscles and ligaments may attach. Some of these features have common names. If you understand each of these names, it will make much more sense what they are. For instance, a trochanter is a very large, lumpy, rough area, that one's specific to the femur. But a tuberosity is a more general term that means a rough, elevated surface. A tubercle is similar, it's specific, however, to the humerus. A crest is a narrow ridge, whereas the spine is a sharp, slender, or narrow process. A condyle is a rounded knob that articulates with another bone, whereas an epicondyle is a projection just superior to the condyle. A ramus is a beam of bone, whereas a head is a rounded surface, often inside a joint. A facet is a smooth, flat, kind of concave surface where a fossa is more of a depression, more of a shallow area. A meatus is a bit like a tunnel. A foramen is a hole through a bone, it's usually round. A fissure is a slit or crack between two bones. Malleolus is specific to your two ankle bones, or actually inferior protuberances of your lower limb bones. And a notch is actually like a U-shaped depression in a bone. We see that in parts of our pelvis. And then a protuberance is just a piece of bone that's sticking out. Bones of the axial skeleton include the skull, where we'll go through eight of our cranial bones. There are 14 facial bones. We have bones associated with the skull, including auditory ossicles, as well as the hyoid bone. The vertebral column has 24 vertebrae. In addition, there's the sacrum and coccyx, as well as the 24 ribs of the thoracic cage in the sternum. We'll begin with the skull. Here we have the cranial bones, occipital, frontal, two parietal, two temporal, sphenoid, and ethmoid. The sutures of the skull are where these bones come together. We can see the coronal suture shown here in red, cross the front between the frontal bone and the parietal bones. The sagittal suture is along the midline of the skull between the two parietal bones. The squamous suture makes sort of a rounded portion between the parietal bone and the temporal bone. We can see on the posterior side the lambdoid suture between the parietal bones and the occipital bone and the occipitomastoid suture, which is the inferior part of the occipital bone and the temporal bone. In the infant skull, we can see there are some similarities, but some marked differences. The infant skull has ossification centers or growth centers that sort of protrude out a bit. The fusion between the bones are not complete at birth. This provides an advantage to allow the skull to compress and maneuver through the birth canal, and then allow for fusion after the child has been born, and allow, also allowing for some additional brain growth to occur. Fontanelles are fibrous connective tissue where bone has yet to grow, and it is just this connective tissue over the brain, and therefore, very susceptible to damage in the infant until the skull finalizes its growth into these areas. We can see the fontanelles indicated here. Listed, we can see the anterior fontanelle circled in red. On the posterior side, where the sagittal suture meets up with the lambdoid suture, is going to be the posterior or occipital fontanelle. Then on the anterior lateral surface in teal, we have the anterolateral or sphenoidal fontanelles, and between the occipital bone, temporal bone, and parietal bones, we see the posterior lateral fontanelle indicated in purple. Now let's continue with the cranial bones. 
The frontal bone is really what makes up our forehead. The two features there are the frontal squama, which is pretty much your forehead, and the supraorbital margin, which is the ridge line near your eyebrows. Our parietal bone, there are no features that you need to know. You just need to know right or left parietal bone because there are two. We can see the left in this image. The temporal bone, however, has a number of features. I have the four listed that I will test you on. The three additional features are important to know that we will not be covering in this lecture. The proper way to say a feature, such as the zygomatic process in number one, is to say the feature first of the bone. In this case, because we have two temporal bones, the space that represents you indicating whether it's a left temporal bone or the right temporal bone. So in this case, number one indicates in this little ridge line, the zygomatic process of the left temporal bone. Then we have the mastoid process of the left temporal bone. You can feel this prominent bulge just behind your ear. Then the styloid process of the left temporal bone. And finally, your external auditory or acoustic canal of the left temporal bone. The occipital bone, we have three features that you'll need to know. We have the external occipital protuberance. It's the pointy part in the very back of your head. We also have right and left occipital condyles. So you can see in this case, there is only one occipital bone Therefore, right and left is going to be re in reference to the feature. So in blue, that would be the left occipital condyle of the occipital bone. The pink is the right occipital condyle of the occipital bone. It does get redundant, but it is the proper way to say it. And then finally, there's the foramen magnum. That's indicated in black there. It's probably a little hard to see. That is the hole for, through which the spinal cord will appear. We can see the frame and magnum much better from this view and this inferior view of the skull. Occipital protuberance, the condyles, and here they are all together. The ethmoid bone is between the eyes, essentially. We have two features of the ethmoid bone. This is from inside the skull. If we were to look straight down and take the top of the skull off. We have this area in blue is known as the cribriform plate. That's actually where our olfactory bulbs lie and our little nerves to smell with fall through the holes that are in this plate into our nasal cavity. So this is just above our nasal cavity. The red line represents a ridge between these two blue surfaces and that's known as the crista galli. So you'd say the crista galli of the ethmoid bone or the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. This is another view to appreciate the ridge-like structure of the crista galli of the ethmoid bone, shown in red. Now the cribriform plate, shown in blue. From this lateral view, let's peel back and look towards the midline. Here we can see the crista galli, that's highlighted in red, and the blue cribriform plate. It's through holes here that the olfactory nerves will dangle into our nasal cavity. Then we could see within the nasal cavity, the superior and middle nasal concha are part of the ethmoid bone. For the sphenoid bone, we can see just a small portion on the lateral surface of the skull. It's much larger when you look in the left-hand image straight down with the top of the skull removed. Within the sphenoid bone, we have both the right and left optic foramen or canal. This is where the nerves from each eye comes through and then the cella tersica, known as the Turkish saddle. Here I have in the picture of the skull, ball of clay sitting in the cella tersica. That ball of clay represents the pituitary gland that sits in the cella tersica of the sphenoid bone. In this view, we can see the pituitary gland again sitting in the cella tersica. We can see a little blue dot indicating the left optic foramen. This is where the optic nerves from the eyes are coming out. We can see in blue clay, the right and left optic foramen with the right and left optic nerves represented by clay coming out. They actually make an X, which is known as the optic chiasm, right here in this space, right above the cella tersica, above the pituitary gland sitting in the cella tersica. 
This is also why somebody with a pituitary gland tumor may actually have their first symptoms as having vision changes because it could encroach on these nerves coming from the eye. This is where we can see that in highlight, the two blue dots represent the right and left optic foramen, also known as optic canals, and the pink represents the cella turcica. We have the ramus of the mandible, which is this upper portion, the mandibular condyle, where we pivot in opening and closing our mouth. The angle is back here, mandibular notch, the body of the mandible is really this main portion here on either side. Mental foramen, it's a hole. Mental means chin, so you'll have one on either side of your chin where blood vessels and nerve exit. Then you have the alveolar margin. This is this area where the teeth will set in. And then mandibular foramen is unseen in this image because it's on the back side of the ramus. There's actually a hole back here that a nerve will come through that will serve the teeth, but it's on the medial side of the ramus. The maxilla is outlined here in red and shown in yellow. We have the alveolar process. We can see highlighted in pink. Then there is the palatine process. Now we're going to have to look inside the mouth at the roof of the mouth. The palatine process is the anterior portion. There's actually two bones represented here. This line represents the division between the maxilla and the palatine bone po behind it. So the palatine process is this blue region anterior to this line. In this lateral view, we can see the palatine process highlighted in blue. The palatine bone is the bony portion behind the palatine process of the maxilla. So the palatine bone is its own separate bone. What we spoke about earlier in blue was a feature, the palatine process, of the maxilla. In this case, it's just the palatine bone is a bone onto itself. The nasal bone, it's just that. It's sort of high up on your nose, sort of if you were to shove your glasses as high up as it could, that would rest on the bony portion of, of your nose, and that's the nasal bone. The vomer is inside your nasal cavity, and it divides from the floor, from the hard palate up, and it only goes part way up, because the other part of it is actually a protrusion from the ethmoid bone. The zygomatic bone is really the apples of your cheek. So we have the zygomatic bone outlined in red here. And in a closer view, we can see this posterior region is known as the temporal process of the left zygomatic bone in this picture. The hyoid bone is our only free floating bone in the body. It has many muscles attached above it and below it. So for the skull, you should know the bones that we covered that make up the skull, the cranium and facial bones, the bones and features of the skull, as well as the sutures, and be able to name the fontanelles of the infant skull. Now we'll move on to the vertebral column. We can see the vertebral column has some unique characteristics, as well as some interesting curvatures. On the vertebral column, we can break it up into a cervical region, which has seven cervical vertebrae, a thoracic region which, with 12 thoracic vertebrae, a lumbar region with five lumbar vertebrae, a sacrum, which has fused vertebrae, so it's really just one bone in the adult, and the coccyx, which also has some fused vertebrae. I've highlighted these in different colors, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. You can see they do have some unique characteristics. You should be able to tell the differences between each of these. We can see a lateral view as well as a superior view of each of these vertebrae. Features on all vertebrae include the body, which is represented in orange as the thick weight-bearing portion. The spinous process indicated in red is the part that if you were to run your finger down your back, you can feel the bumps. The transverse process protrudes out to the side. They are a place for muscles to attach, or if it's the thoracic region, for ribs to attach. Then we have the pedicle, which is an attachment between the body and this other region, and shown in green, as well as the lamina. 
Then on the lateral side, you can see much better the superior and inferior articulating process. Then the intervertebral foramen is also something that you will only see from the side between the inferior articular process and the superior articular process. The intervertebral foramen are where nerves exit on the side along a whole spinal column. Then there is the vertebral foramen, which is the hole in the middle where the spinal cord would go through. The vertebral canal is where lots of vertebral foramen are stacked up, and that is the entirety of the spinal column. So here we can go through each of these features and see them on each region. We can see the body of the cervical vertebrae or the thoracic vertebrae or lumbar vertebrae. The spinous process we can see from the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. The thoracic has the most prominent downward spiked um, vertebrae and the cervical sometimes has a bifid or split vertebrae you don't, or spinous process, but you don't see that in this picture. Then we have the transverse processes. They stick out on either side. One very unique feature is in the cervical vertebrae, we can see two holes in the transverse process. This is unique to the cervical vertebrae and this is where vertebral arteries will come up through the neck to the brain. Then we have the pedicle, so a right and left pedicle of each of the vertebrae, the lamina of each of these, and from this lateral view, we can see much better the right and left superior articulating facet. So a facet is a small scooped out area, and it's literally one facet. This superior articulating facet here would actually bind to an inferior articulating facet of the adjacent vertebrae. So here we see the superior articulating facets and the inferior articulating facet of each of the vertebrae. So the intervertebral foramen, also known as the neural foramen, are holes laterally where spinal nerves will exit. You can see them right here, here, and here, and spinal nerves will be coming out to the body through them. These holes are formed when two vertebrae are stacked together, and you can see where the superior and inferior articulating facets are linked together. Here's a, another view of these lateral holes or intervertebral foramen. So the vertebral foramen of the vertebrae are found here. This is where you would find the spinal cord. Now the vertebral canal is the whole hollow core of all of these stacked together. There are seven cervical vertebrae. The first two, C1 and C2, have unique shapes. These shapes are specific for their location and purpose. C1 has two cupped facets or cup surfaces where the skull rests on these rounded surfaces. It's the occipital condyles that rest here. The cup shape facilitates the yes or nodding motion of the head. This is known as the atlas. The axis or C2 has a prominent central spike. When this bony process of C2 nestles in with C1 and is bound by the ligament as shown in this smaller image, it allows for the no motion of the head rotating from side to side. Notice the smaller image of C1 showing the ligament that actually holds C2 in place and the position of the circle represents the bony process of C2. C1 is known as the Atlas because the Titan God ordered to hold up the heavens by Zeus. This is an apt comparison to holding the skull atop the vertebral column. We can see here C1 in the left and the occipital condyles in the right that would articulate with it. All the cervical vertebrae, including C1 and C2, have transverse foramen. These are holes within the right and left transverse processes. Vessels bringing blood to and from the brain are found in these holes. Additionally, the spinous process has a split at the end described as a bifid spinous process. This is not as prominent in the last cervical vertebrae. Thoracic vertebrae have the classic look of a vertebrae with long transverse processes and a very pointy spinous process, as well as a moderately sized body. The unique features of these vertebrae are due to their relationship with the ribs. Costal facets or smooth indentations where each rib is positioned are found on ends of the right and left transverse processes, in addition to the facets along the body. 
There are 12 pairs of ribs, each bound to one of the 12 thoracic vertebrae. Ribs angle downward as they wrap around anteriorly. This position and pivot points along the thoracic vertebrae are an integral part of how we breathe in and out. There are five large lumbar vertebrae. These are larger in size than the cervical and thoracic because they bear much more weight and have much larger muscles attached to them to allow the upper body to bend in a number of directions. In addition, the spinous process is short and blunt rather than long and slender in the other vertebrae. The sacrum is made of five vertebrae fused together. It is shaped like a primitive shovel. This sacrum is shown from a male. The male sacrum is much more curved than the female sacrum. The shallow, almost flat surface of the female sacrum best accommodates a developing fetus and maintains a wider opening for birth. Here we can see a real female sacrum bone from a couple of angles, as well as the comparative male sacral bone. In the context of the pelvis, we can see the shallow nature of the female compared to the more curved nature of the male. Finally, the coccyx is three to five vertebrae fused together and it's known as our tailbone. In the male, it actually comes in and points into the pelvic channel where the female, it would actually can point more downward. So for the vertebral column, you should know components of the vertebral column, what is on each vertebrae as that is common to all vertebrae. You should know characteristics that are specific to just the cervical or just the thoracic or lumbar vertebrae. You should know the vertebrae that make up the sacrum and coccyx, as well as specific characteristics of the sacrum regarding male and female differences. Now the rib cage. Of our 12 pair of ribs, the first seven ribs off the thoracic vertebrae are known as true ribs. They are considered to be true ribs because they have a bone to bone attachment. They originate from the thoracic vertebrae posteriorly and attach anteriorly to the sternum. False ribs come from the next three thoracic vertebrae. False ribs start from the thoracic vertebrae eight through 10 and then indirectly to the sternum via hyaline cartilage. Finally, floating ribs come off of the last two thoracic vertebrae. Floating ribs have only one attachment point. They attach to the thoracic vertebrae 11 and 12, but do not have an anterior attachment. The sternum or breastbone has three features. The manubrium is the wide top portion where the first rib attaches. The body is where the other true ribs attach. The very bottom is a small pointy region called the xiphoid process. This is the region you have to avoid when giving cardiopulmonary resuscitation chest compressions or it could break and cause damage. For the rib cage, you should know the number of ribs and the different types and why they are classified as such, as well as the parts and features of the sternum.